Good afternoon, folks, and welcome to this ninth installment of our webinar series on geology and the mining sector. Today, we are diving into build. Lots to uh, unpack. As usual, if you have any questions during uh, this uh, duration of this webinar, feel free to type them on the left, uh, right hand side uh, of your screen in the chat box. We'll um, grab all those questions and cover them at the end of the webinar. If you are watching this in a replay on YouTube, feel free to send those questions in at info at iddpnql.ca. Thank you. So just give me a few seconds for me to share my screen. So welcome to the last lesson of block three. Just gonna move my windows around. So block three, building a mine, uh, separate in several uh, subjects compared to the other lessons. We have a few more um, because I wanted to cover the entire um, main subjects about build the process of building a mine. Um, so that you could have a general idea through the uh, the steps. So like uh, usually, uh, definition, when is mining? Mining is the activity that removes from the Earth's crust uh, the abnormal concentration of metal found in the deposit. So mining is extracting ore or minerals from the ground. Uh, mine is an opening or excavation of the Earth from which minerals are extracted. The theoretical or mathematical uh, definition of a mine is known as the Taylor's formula, as T is, uh, represents the years, uh, which, and the R represents the mineable reserves in tons. So the number of years is equal to 0.20%, 0 0.2 uh, times the reserves in tons. The thing you have to remember is that mining is one of the riskiest investments, which many risks to consider at with many risks to consider at every stage. And this I will try to pinpoint today throughout the lesson. So more conveniently, if we come back to our mining life uh, illustration, what we've seen within the uh, prior lessons. Block one, everything that has to do with prospecting. Block two, everything that has to do with exploration. And now we are into the mine development and production within the mine life cycle. So the mine production is the third phase of the mining cycle. It consists of the main steps for the actual development of the mining complex site. Uh, as we've seen, the first blocks were exploration. Now we're ending the mining block. And uh, next week, I will start the uh, last block for everything that has to do with reclam reclamation or closure of a mine. I based this uh, lesson uh, for everything that has to do with the mine life cycle on the uh, Lasson curve. The Lasson curve is based on uh, an expert in mining known as Pierre Lasson. He has defined, uh, based on uh, several decades of mineral exploration, discoveries, and development experience, a chart that is used, that has been used and is still used as a guide for the mining industry known as the Lasson curve. And it outlines the life of mining companies from exploration to production and highlights the work and market value associated to each step stages. And it also helps speculative investors to understand the mining process and the time their investments uh, and to time their investments also properly within each stage. So this is um, 
a simple example of the Lasson curve, if you go uh, search within the uh, Google, within the internet, you will find several versions, several different kinds of graphics. Uh, I like this one because it's very simple, very easy to understand, and it has a very simple visualization. And it shows the life cycle through time, through each step, each stages that we will go through today and defines each stages, the main activities with the general time-lapse that we have to consider for each steps. And also how the value of the mind goes from low value to high value within each uh, steps of the mind. So in the life cycle of a mineral deposit, there are seven stages that each offer specific risks and rewards. The mining company proves there is a mineable deposit in the ground and more value is created for shareholders along the way. So the first step is the concept. So before going on the field, before doing any prospecting and exploration work, this stage carries the most risk, which accounts for its low value. Beginning with no or very little knowledge of what actually lies beneath the Earth's surface, the geologist or the prospector has to go on the field, has to start um, before, before going the field, has to know a bit of the historical ground. So we'll go through historical work that has been done in the area. At this stage, the geologists are putting to the, to the test theories about where the metal deposits are. So what are they going to use? I've seen in the prior lessons they're going to use different kinds of surveys. They're going to survey the land using geological, geophysical, and geochemical and sampling techniques to improve their confidence and their knowledge uh, with it for the theories they have within the uh, study area. Once this is complete, they can move on into a more extensive exploration. So once they arrive on the field, they will need to add up some information. And here again, as, as we've seen in the prior lessons, the scales is very important. So going on the field, adding more data within the area and having more systematic data that fills in the spatial uh, study area will add some value to the project because it will add some pre precision to the project. Moving on to the pre-discovery stage of the Lasson curve, there we have a higher risk where speculation hype begins. As the drill bit meets the ground, the mineral exploration geologists develop their knowledge and what lies beneath the Earth's crust to assess mineral potential. So as many extra uh, cores that the geologists will observe and interpret as many more um, drill holes that will be added within the studied area, the more the geologists will learn about the project and will lower, hence lower the risk of the project. The mineral exploration involves retrieving a cross section, so drill cores of the crust, and then analyzing it for mineral content. The drill core containing sufficient amounts of metals can encourage further exploration, which may lead to the discovery of a mineable deposit. So as many more drill cores, drill holes that are added to a project, the better finance or financial sources the company can have to support these exploration works. The pre-discovery is can be separated into four steps the exploration strategy so here before going on the field we have to know what we're working from so we have to go as i said within the historical work historical reports historical maps extract all the information that we judge important we have to learn to work from unknown and work from known so working from known is everything that has been done historically. Working from the unknown is once we are in the field, we pick up new observations that, will, that we will try to combine to old observations and set up our new interpretations. So our new interpretations 
with the historical data is the first piece of the puzzle. The second step for the pre-discovery is really doing an enhanced prospecting work. Prospecting work on the field includes everything that has to do with the claim staking and the permitting of the study area, going out, mapping, going from outcrops to outcrops, trying to find some showings, uh, either uh, known showings or try to find new showings, um, including all the surveys we've seen, uh, geological, geophysical, um, geochemical, try to find any indica indicator minerals that are associated with the mineral we are looking for. Example, for gold, we would be looking for um, any arsenic uh, higher concentrations and so on. So the prospecting on the field is the second piece of the puzzle that will help us resolve the entire puzzle. The third of the pre-discovery is what we call the early stage exploration. If during the prior stage, which was the prospecting, the 2B stage, we think we are on to new discoveries or uh, uh, closely uh, approaching new discoveries, we wanna know for sure what we're seeing on the surface, we will do early stage exploration. So we will add uh, more complete information with the geophysics, with the ground, the geochemistry, everything we can add with our uh, observations for structures. We will do some uh, trenches, some uh, outcrop uh, stripping, and so on. So all this added information will be processed within our GIS maps and new newer interpretations or geological uh, mineralization models will come out. And this completes uh, the first stage of the pre-discovery right before bringing in the, what we call the troop machine, which are our drill, drills to drill, grounds and drill are defined um, targets. So drilling we will have new samples coming out from our core logging. We will have more added data from our assays, assays uh, for the economic results, but we, we can also have a uh, little geochemical um, analysis. All this, all this new data is brought in into the system and again is processed with everything that was observed on the surface and is reinterpreted once again and adds up a fourth piece within the puzzle. And once we are really um, conf uh, confident of all of this, we come to our discovery phase. Discovery phase is when we are really happy. It's our reward stage. And it's also the reward stage for speculators. Reward stage for speculators adds or eases the finance for the project. And this is a stage where a lot of um, investors come in and spe speculators go out. Exploration has revealed the presence of significant amount of material to be mined. And it warrants further study to prove that mining would be feasible. So these further studies would be, as we've seen in the uh, drill hole lesson, to uh, add drill holes within a systematic pattern, either stepping out from the deposit to try to find and define its complete geometry, uh, lateral and depth extents, its orientation, its dip, and so on. And once we have the uh, zoomed out image, we also want to push it in and have more precision. And so within the extent of the deposit, we will do some infill drilling. So we reduce the distance between the already drilled area and we add drill holes to refine and make sure we uh, can really define the contours and the geometry and the changes in direction and or depth of the deposit. Once we have all this information, everything is again blended in with 
all the prior information from the surface and whatever other underground information we have. And we are at the stage where we can do the resource models and the uh, estimation uh, work on the discovery to know if we can go on and maybe open a mine. So here, most spec speculators exist, exit here as the next stage creates a new set of risks, such as pro profitability, construction, and financing. So speculators stay in between two stages, uh, probably between, if we go back, uh, between 2A and 2C. Once we have the drill hole and we have more information and we cannot speculate no more, the specula speculators go out and um, more um, important investors uh, come in the project. So once we are sure of our discovery, before opening a mine, any financial institution will ask to have a feasibility uh, report. Feasibility report is an important milestone for a mineral discovery, and it studies uh, conducted. It is studies that are conducted during this stage may demonstrate the deposit's potential to become a profitable mine. The institutional and strategic investors can then use these studies to evaluate whether they want to advance this project or not. The speculators often invest during this time, known as the orphan period, while uncertainty about the project lingers. Once the feasibility report is out, again, the speculators are out. So what does it involve? This feasibility uh, report will include every aspect of the study project. So it will ask to add more drill holes. It will ask to do some metallurgical tests to exactly understand what kind of mineralization environment we are working on. It will also ask to do a complete environmental assess report on the impact of the opening of this mine. The risk assessment that has to do with everything that has to do with either risk uh, financially or risk, uh, physical risk within the area and so on. The 3D model is kept alive with all this extra data. The mine design is uh, also conceptual, but done here. So the engineers are involved here and they will help also with the risk assessment, with the 3D model, with uh, the areas where we need to add more drill holes, and they will want to know what uh, metallurgical um, characteristics or traits we are working on. So this completes the entire puzzle uh, of uh, data that is needed up until the feasibility uh, report. Once the feasibility report is uh, saying, yes, you can go forward, you have something, you have something worth uh, opening a mine, we are within the uh, development stage. You have to understand that the development stage is rare and most mineral deposits never make it to this stage. At this point, the company puts together a production plan for the mine. So funding must be secured and an operational team must be set up. And the company secures funding for the development. Investors can see the potential of revenue for mining. And we'll see in the next lesson that in this step, the funding also for the mine restoration once it will close has to be secured. The risks still persist in this stage in the form of construction, budget, and timelines. With the, opening, uh, with the opening, a mineral deposit for exploitation begins the actual mining of the deposit, now called ore. So once we know that our deposit is good for opening a mine, it has a new tag, which is called ore. Access to the deposit is gained by either stripping the overburden, so either stripping soil and or rock covering the deposit, 
to expose the uh, near surface ore for mining. So the stripping is done, the stripping of the overburden is done if the minerals are to be mined at the surface. Economic considerations determine the stripping ratio, depending also on what ore we are stripping. Example for coal mines, it has a ratio of uh, waste to ore of about uh, 38 meter ton, metric ton, sorry, uh, to as low as 0.8 metric ton in metal mines. Some non-metallic mines have no overburden to remove, and so they are simply excavated directly from the surface. Excavating openings from the surface to access more deeply buried deposits to prepare the underground mine is, can also take place. Certain preliminary development work will generally be required before any development takes place, such as acquiring water and mining rights, buying surface lands, arranging for financing, preparing permit applications, and environmental impact statements. In the next lesson, I will go through the lists of permits and uh, environmental impact studies that we need to do before opening a mine. When these steps have been achieved, a number of additional requirements needs to be validated. So the access to roads and infrastructures, the power sources, the mineral transportation systems, the mineral processing facilities, the waste disposal areas, offices, and the other facilities must precede actual mining in most cases. So before even thinking of opening a mine, the plan has to be defined from A to Z, even how the mineral is going to be transported. So nothing is left to chance and nothing is left to last minute decision. Everything is pre-planned years in advance. The development for underground mining is generally more complex and expensive, and it requires careful planning and layout of access openings for efficient mining, safety, and permanence. The principal openings may be shafts, slopes, or adits. The adits are usually, I put it here, are usually used for when the deposit, the mining uh, environment is horizontal, and it's the same entrance that is used for the water, the ventilation, and the mineral extraction, and the human traffic. Uh, so each opening is important to understand that must be planned to allow passage of workers, machines, or waste, air, water, and utilities. Many metal mines are located along steeply uh, dipping deposits and thus are open from shafts, while drifts, winces, and raises serve the protection areas. Many coal and non-metallic mines are found in nearly horizontal deposits, and their primary openings may be drifts or entries which may be distinctively different from those of metal mines. So the concept and the architecture of a mine is also directly related to what kind of ore are we going to mine. So we are moving on to the startup production exploitation. So what we've seen so far within the last zone curve, everything that had to do from prospect, exploration, and discovery included steps one to three. Then we moved on to uh, everything to prove and make sure and uh, work and define the concept of the mine has to do with the steps four and five, the feasibility report and the construction uh, concept. And now we are within the mining and extraction before the closure of the mine. So. Understand again, this is a rare moment for a mineral discovery. The company is now processing ore and generating revenue like any other company. Investors who have held their investment until this point can, can pat themselves and con con congratulate themselves because they are finally uh, making money too. Investments analysts will re-rate this deposit to help attract more attention from institutional investors and the general public. So you have to understand, even if the mine is open and has started production, every X uh, 
year, there will be an analyst that will re-rate the deposit, re-rate the mine. And this will help attract new investors, new money in, and help also put new money into uh, an always existing exploration team that will always try to find uh, new deposits, new zones, new extension, either laterally or in depth to keep the mine alive and open as long as possible. So existing investors can choose to exit here or wait for potential increases in revenues and dividends. The exploitation is associated with the actual recovery of minerals from the earth in quantity. So although the development may continue, the emphasis, the emphasis is, is in the production stage on the production. Usually only enough development is done prior to exploitation to ensure that production once started can continue uninterrupted throughout the life of a mine. But this is in an utopic perfect world. And sometimes uh, because the interpretation or the new data uh, changes um, prior interpretations, sometimes the mine has to be uh, closed for a while, put on standby uh, because the deposit as it was interpreted has changed. And so uh, some work has to be uh, adapted to the new interpretation, maybe build new drifts and so on. So if everything goes well, it goes smoothly without change, but a mine concept development architecture can also change during its life. The mining method selected for exploitation is determined mainly by the characteristics of the mineral deposit and the limits imposed by safety, technology, environmental concerns, and economics. So that is another important point uh, I wanna show today. Uh, the geologic conditions such as the dip shape and strength of the ore and the surrounding host rock plays a key role in selecting the method. So nothing is left to chance. I've listed here the main uh, factors that will influence which choice of mining method will be chosen for the concept of the mine. The main ones, the more important ones are geologically related. As I've spoken from my other lessons, every detail that can be observed for a deposit is really important for the development of the mine. So by no surprise, the shape of the ore body, is it tabular, is it cylindrical, is it spherical, is it like a potato, is it a tin, is it like tin lens, and so on will directly influence the choice of mining method. The orientation of the ore body, is it sub-horizontal or sub-vertical? It could be sub-horizontal within uh, sedimentary beds where the ore body is completely flat. So there is a mining technique for sub-horizontal deposits versus sub-vertical steep deposits. The continuity of the ore body, is it within a continuous lens or envelope, or is it within non-continuous little tin veins that were displaced by several structures? The size of the ore body, is the size, is it big enough to be mined, to be, to always uh, be safe? Because the, during the mining, the, each drifts, steps, whatever is used depending on an open pit or underground mine. There are um, limitations that are applied by engineers for the minimum of the development to be secure. So the size of the ore body is important. The depth of the ore body, is it in, on the surface, near the surface? Is it uh, one kilometer deep, two kilometer deep, and so on? The ore grade. Is it high grade? Is it low grade? The distribution of the ore bearing minerals within the ore body, what kind of mineralization are we talking about? Is it disseminated sulfurs? Is it uh, massive sulfurs? Is it semi-massive sulfurs? 
Is it within the within a vein? What is the cutoff grade that we're gonna use? Um, the depth of the overburden. Do we have to strip away a very thick overburden, or is it close to the surface? Um, the strength or the rheology, I should say, of the ore body and the overburden, and also from the host rocks. Are we working within soft, brittle rocks? Again, that will play some important factors within the safety. Or uh, are we uh, surrounded with hard, um, really solid host rocks? The projected production rates, how much are we going to produce per day? Is it enough to be economically viable? The capital costs, the rate of the financial recovery, the cash flow that was invested, uh, and that is this, this uh, um, that is available for the project. The area of the land available for waste disposal, this is very important uh, factor between if we decide do we want to do an open pit or underground mining. Open pit mines will cover a larger surface area and hence will generate a greater volume of waste. We'll see that a little bit later on. Safety concerns. Everything that has to do with surface mining methods, which are usually or uh, known to have a better safety record versus underground uh, mines, which have several safety hazards, uh, both for the workers and maybe for also the people uh, living around. The impacts on surface, the Everything that has to do with the environmental impacts, the drainage, the subsurface aquifers, the land use changes, the social impacts also for the communities around. And finally, everything that has to do with the rehabilitation concerns. When the mine is going to close, how is the area going to be cleaned out so to leave the less environmental impact and also for the social impact left behind by the closing of the mines. So the choice of mining methods you'll see is not something that is decided uh, by flipping a coin. It's every uh, detail is, is important. So what determines the type of mining? So first, between underground mining and surface mining, the five, uh, five major factors, again, geological, the depth below the surface of the position of the deposit, the size of the ore body, the shape of the dep deposit, the grade, and the type of ore. So understand that underground mining is mainly for deep, deeper uh, ore bodies, which are richer with high grades, and surface mining are for shallow ore bodies near the surface and usually with lower grade. So the, we'll go through some of the main classic uh, traditional exploitation methods uh, we, that are divided into two categories based on the deposit type and which mining approach we are going for. So we, they are divided by the surface and the underground mining. Surface mining has several techniques. I've listed the main ones here. And underground mining is usually classified into three methods. And we'll see them here. And here I just put the same image of the same ore body so that you can understand how same ore body can be treated either by open pit mining or by underground mining. Um, and just to understand, within the underground mining, we have the we have three methods: unsupported, supported, and caving. Caving is the one that will resemble the most open pit mining because it's the only underground mining method that can reach similar production rates to the surface mining, and that it's the metal that involves undermining an ore body so that it allows it to collapse under its own weight. I've included the link here so you can go see the entire method. Basically, with the open pit, 
you can see that there is a volume of waste or sterile rock that is taken out before reaching the ore body. While the underground mining, we have a shaft and we have the drifts reaching the ore body. So, as seen here, the main difference also for the impacts is the volume of waste rock within which method we are working for or with. So a surface mine example here will take out 73% of the total waste rock volume versus underground mine, the same mine, if we would do it underground, 7%. So that would play a huge, uh, is an important crucial factor that we'll have to use for the decision as do we do an open pit or an underground mine. So if I go through each method, just simple surface mining. What is surface mining? Surface mining is a mining method in which soil and rocks are removed to reach underlying ore body that was near the surface. So we start from the surface and we go down steps. And these steps, the, the dip of the steps are defined by in the engineers based on the rocks uh, hardness and solidity or, or rheology. So the open pit mining ores are mined downward layer by layer. Example of this method would be for diamond, gold and copper mines, which are often done with open pit mining. The surface mining can be separated into three, uh, no, sorry, into five, no, yeah, into the quarry, the open pit, and the strip mining. And I think, I, yeah, I have two other methods that are less used uh, here, but are more used out in the West. So first, the quarry um, mainly extracts rocks to be used and either left intact for building blocks or facing stone or they are crushed for cement making and road beds. Open pit is just mine with large ore bodies located near the surface, and they are the ones that cause the most permanent changes to any local topography terrain. And the strip mining are the ones that where the ore zone is overlain by veg vegetation, soil, or non ore rock that must be removed. So they're used for ore bodies, which occur in layers that are generally parallel, parallel to the surface, meaning horizontal. The squirrels banks are designed to collect the waste rock. The current reclamation law requires that it be returned to the pit and the original soil replaced. It is expensive, but uh, uh, vital. So example here of the quarries. So the quarries, it's either the intact blocks that are uh, used as uh, for building or facing stones or more crushed for cement and making and road beds. The uh, other types of surface mining, I will just show some examples. So we have the open pit, the dredging, the strip, strip soil, and the strip vegetation. So the open pit, classic open pit here is an excavation or cut made at the surface of the ground for the purpose of extracting ore and which is open to the surface for the duration of the mine's life. Usually when once the mine is closing, the pit has to be uh, restored as was before the, the mine opened. To expose and mine the ore, it is generally necessary to excavate and relocate large quantities of waste rock. So a uh, good example here of the of open mining used when the ore bodies lie near the surface. There are, as you can see, there are large hole exposes the ore body. Waste rock overburden is removed and needs a place to be moved to. It is the second cheapest method, but the largest as seen here, env environmental impact with the area, leaving a big depression within the area, within a closed city here, 
So once the mine is closed, this has to be taken care of. So again, I want people to understand it's not, and nothing is left to chance here. So everything has to be prepared. The concepts has to be defined. Um, the site, the mind site has to be prepared. So plans are defined uh, and put on the terrain so we know exactly where our waste piles are gonna be, our restoration sites, etc. So we have to prepare the mine sites, build the complete facilities um, for the people, for the offices, and so on. We have to know how or which method are gonna be used for the uh, mine operations management. We have to understand or be able to visualize what is going to be our complete techniques because we can also have a combination of two we can start with an open pit uh, and once we have or, or we discover other zones which are deeper and cannot be done anymore by the open pit um, can be defined uh, to an added concept so either adding some drifts uh, with spirit spiral rents and so on to be able to reach deeper zones. So the, we need to know all this configuration to know exactly what kind of permits we need so and what kind of mining equipment we need. And, and I also know the evaluation, the economic evaluation of the project to be prepared financially. Everything has to be put in place in reality along on the terrain. Where are going to be? Where is going to be our open pit? Where are we going to drive our a waste? Where are going to be our buildings, our roads to reach the open pit, and so on? So the other types of surface mining that are used in placer mines basically we used out west. Um, basically used for gold and tin are the ones using the sluice box. They were uh, result, resulting from water sediment slurry, which is filtered or just passed on through these boxes, which works as a micro um, river dam system, which is man controlled and is used to separate the gold and the black sands from other worthless materials commonly found in, in a river. Other methods for placer mines would be using a dredger, which is a huge high pressure gasoline water pump, which sucks up the water, the gravel and the gold, and injects this material within the sluice box and ejects the water out and filters the material in between. This uh, dredging can also be done um, under for underwater mineral deposits. And the dredging is really used to clear or enlarge the, the same material that is used to enlarge waterways for boats is used. And uh, is advantage is that it is either mobile or stationary. We have the hydraulic mines that we don't usually use for gold or things like that. It is mainly used out west uh, for gold and um, for another um, material that you've probably heard during the news for everything that has to do with uh, uh, schist, with the uh, gas, the schist, uh, which is the hydraulic mine. So it's mainly a form of mining that uses high pressure jets of water to dislodge the rock material and move the sediment. The mining stripe uh, the, for the surface mining, the stripe mines for either a soil or a vegetation. So the ore zone is overlain by a vegetation. The ore zone is usually parallel, so horizontal to the surface and the spoil banks are designed to collect the waste rock. Uh, one of the instruments used for this is the giant uh, large bucket wheel extractor that we see here. Um, basically for the environment, it will do the same impact as an open pit. Uh, the ore body is very next to the surface. 
and that is why it's not an open pit uh, as per se. It requires the removing of all the overburden and then just to extract, um, which is close to the surface right under the uh, vegetation. If we move on to the underground mining now, the generally, uh, it is generally hard to see where they are located when we are on the surface. Uh, so the area of disturbance is very local. The miners place the drifts close to the ore body to cut down on waste. Once the mines are closed, they can be sealed with the non-ore rock, the waste rock, and the surface collapse generally limited and controllable with modern mine reclamation practices. Uh, which is a bit different from everything that was done from the past, from historical abandoned and forgotten mines, which are, is, is still a problem now. And uh, even though you have to keep in mind, even though visually they are not as, as seen as the uh, open pit, uh, physically they can cause or have uh, bigger impacts than open pits with everything that has to do with the stability of the soil around underground mining. So example here of an ore buddy that has been started up to a limit uh, using the open pit. Uh, maybe exploration team found deeper, uh, going deeper, found new zones. So um, it was chosen to add a ramp from the pit, the bottom of the pit to do a spiral ramp, but also to add a shaft and to add some drifts to reach out uh, lower, deeper levels. So the grade is high enough to exceed production costs. So that also is important. All this um, equipment, all these techniques are highly uh, expensive and the production costs have to cover all the expenses and uh, also leave a revenue like any other company. Another point um, people forget, a mine is like, it's working like a company. A mine is there to make profit like any other company would do. Underground mining methods are usually classified in two categories of methods, soft rock mining methods and hard rock mining methods. Soft rock methods are either long wall mining, room to pillar mining, blast mining, short wall mining, and the coal skimming mining. Uh, soft rock, rock are the ones that are brittle um, and they have uh, a lower rheology as per se hard rock mining methods for harder, uh, higher rheology uh, units use the short haul and long haul mining methods, selective and unselective mining methods, and finally the supported and unsupported mining methods. Example here of the uh, famous La Ronde VMS gold mine deposit, which is one of the deepest ones in the country. Uh, the mineral extraction processing, uh, that too, is important to take into consideration as the kind of mine we are gonna do and also to plan the surface and underground terrain. So or, uh, keep in mind that ore rock is ground or crushed for extraction. The fine waste material is placed in tailings. The tailings are exposed to wind and weather. Harmful elements such as mercury, arsenic, cadmium or uranium can be leached out. The surface and subsurface water systems can be contaminated. Chemicals used in ore extraction must be controlled and not just dumped. And finally, the smelting ores to extract metals can produce metal laden, exhaust gas or ash, sulfur oxide and acid rain pollution and must be scrubbed before discharging. The mineral extraction processing, the, or if we enter the metallurgy, so how is our ore going to be processed? Depends on, is it an oxide ore? If it is an oxide ore, hydrometallurgy processes will be used. And oxides are often, are 
or is often more abundant near the surface and is usually of lower grades. Hydrometallurgy process is less expensive. If our ore is, so, is a, classified as a sulfide ore, the method used is pyrometallurgy. So the sulfide ores is less, are less abundant and uh, is, are usually higher grade ore. The pyrometallurgy process is more expensive. Here we have an example of the pyrometallurgy processes. They use physical steps and high temperatures to extract and purify the metals. And the steps that are used are the frop flotation, the thickening, the smelting, and the electrolysis. So the smelting, the smelter in Rouen Oranda for the uh, copper uh, ore deposit is a good example. So the processing metallurgy also is very important to defining what uh, kind of uh, and the concept of the mine. So we have our mining, our transporting, and how are we going to do our primary crushing? And once we decide, do we are we working with an oxide ore or with a sulfide ore? If we're working with an oxide ore, we are using the heap leaching, the solvent extraction, and the electro twinning electro winning. If we are dealing with a sulfide ore, we're using with uh, the pyrometallurgy approach, which includes the uh, froth flotation, the thickening, smelting, and the electrolysis to have our final product, in this case, example, copper. So the metals obtain the, uh, the most um, Common examples of metals that we can obtain from ores, I've listed them here, aluminum or iron, uh, metals from conductors or semiconductors, uh, everything that has to do with gems, gold and silver, uh, the lead from galena, uh, the copper from uh, um, calcopyrite, malachite and azurite, zinc from sphalerite, uh, lead from galena, again, and the many other metals from found in the rocks, we'll see some at the end of the presentation too. Finally, once the mine has reached the end, so like everything else, nothing lasts forever, especially scarce mineral resources. So unless there are more deposits nearby, most mines are eventually depleted. With it, so does the value of the company and the investors look for an exit as operation wind down. So sometimes the mines close after X time, the, the defined time, the initial X defined time of the mine, like let's say 10 years and everything went well. So it lasted the 10 years and unfortunately there is no more uh, reserves. So the mine closes down. Sometimes the mine closes down because the demand is not there or the uh, price of the commodity has lowered and it costs more uh, with less revenue. So everything is put on standby or sometimes because of the technology, the mine cannot be um, explored deeper. And so it is closed and sometimes reopened later on with newer technology so we can reach uh, deeper grounds. So there are several reasons why a mine can close and never open again, or sometimes reopen X years later. Again, so to go an important the part also of understanding, understanding mines and how to build a mine is to know or understand the concept between resource versus reserves. So just a little recap, what is an ore? Ore is a mineral or aggregate of minerals which can be mined, so extracted and processed at a profit. If there's no profit, there is no ore and there is no mine. How to determine if a rock is ore? Well, the grade, a grade, the grade of the ore, the type of ore, the size and depth of the deposit, the location of the deposit, you can have the richest, bigger, biggest mine, but if it is located directly within a highly 
a preserved environmental area. It will never open as a mine. Mineral deposit also containing something valuable. So a vein, a simple quartz vein is not a mineral deposit. The same quartz vein that has or hosts some gold can become an ore to be mined at a profit. So minerals are non-renewable resources. This too is an important point. Uh, when I uh, often understand, uh, uh, hear people say, so why does the mine close? Well, a mine is not like a fruit tree. It doesn't renew and it doesn't regrow whatever deposit is there and it has been mined out, it does not regrow. So it is non-renewable. So because the amounts that exist and are finite, although most are very abundant, it will shut down or be completely extracted and gone. Economically, recoverable resources account for a tiny proportion of the total that exists. The main limitations on mineral availability are the locations, the chemical form, and the purity of the deposits, and also the availability of the technologies to exploit them. If we don't have the uh, exact or the, uh, the better technology uh, or the right technology to go to reach the deposits, it's always the question of reaching out the deposit. Well, it will stay there until the right method is uh, developed to go get that deposit. Their exploitation is economically important, but can cause environmental damages too. So that we'll see more within the next lesson. Um, other point important is to differentiate between mineral resource versus the uh, reserves. The resource is what we call the sub-economic versus the reserves, which is the economic, so they're recoverable. The mineral resource, as defined here within this classic um, diagram that is used for years, is the total amount of valuable geological material in all deposits, discovered and undiscovered. So that's the important point there which includes all the material which is theoretically available for exploitation. And this includes deposits that cannot be exploited now. Example, uh, as stock priorly, it is too deep, it has a low grade, unusable chemical form, it's prohibitive land use, conflicts with the uh, community, communities around, etc. The mineral reserves them here showed here in blue this are the discovered deposits of geological resource that can be extracted economically and legally under present conditions they include the portion of the resource which can be exploited now economically using a existing technology so the resource is the the mineral reserves is now when the study is done so we cannot project in five years, depending on whichever technology, new technology that comes in. It is with what is available now and not in the future. So that also is important. So if we have a two part zone and one part is really deep, let's say past three, four kilometers, it cannot be included within the reserves because right now, let's say we don't have the right technology to reach it. It has to remain into reserves and stay out of the reserves. The size of a resource is finite, but the quantity included in the reserves can change. That too is important to understand. Many people don't understand that. The reserves will increase if there is an increase in market price or if new extraction technologies are developed. If the market prices drop, then the reserves may decrease. So the reserves, when the study is done, gives X amount of reserves. Well, it is important to understand that that number can change, can either increase or decrease. And that can have major influence on the mine cycle life. How the mineral resource are um, 
priorly were said calculated. Now everybody's careful. They're not saying calculated anymore. They're saying estimated. The uh, approach has changed considerably, considerably during the past 25 years. Before this, the estimation would be done at the last stage when we were extremely sure the mine would open and would be done once with the entire data available. Uh, and it would usually be done uh, with a lot of manual methods. Now, the mineral resource is done for every 43101 report, assessment report, and for every new uh, financial demand uh, within a, a banking institution, it will need an up-to-date mineral resource. So mineral resource uh, are done more than once on a project now. They are using uh, highly sophisticated uh, softwares to keep everything, all the data within the deposit, within the deposit which is divided in equal cells. And within these cells, the information of the deposit is projected so that we directly know where are our high grade zones, where are our lower grade zones, where are the, the parts of our deposit which are re richer, hence would be the first parts to develop our mining drifts to reach and be the first parts to mine out and so on. So the fundamental key to successful mine mineral project is resource estimation with a clear understanding of the resource geology and uh, the mining aspects of the deposits. So again, all the geological observations that were done priorly to the opening of the mine are going to be key here to understand and have the best mineral resource estimation. A lot of projects in the past, once the mine has opened, because there was a lack or a misinterpretation in the geology, uh, once the mine was open and the production was on, some of the deposits interpretation changed drastically, so drastically that the mineral resource uh, changed a lot. And sometimes even the geological and mineralization environment changed completely adding the new data, and that can have a drastic effect on the mine cycle life. The mineral resource can be divided into three categories, uh, and they're basically based on the increasing of the geological confidence into inferred, indicated, and measured. The mineral reserves, uh, the ore reserves, are those proportions of the mineral resource that after the application of all the modifying factors, result in an estimated tonnage and grade. So we have our categories, proven, probable, with our tons, our uh, cutoff, and the um, production. The ore reserves are subdivided into two, three categories in order to of the increasing confidence, probable ore, proved ore, and we have the indicated. This is another classical uh, schema that we've been using for years that are included uh, worldwide into the uh, standardized uh, uh, report assessments that each country has to do. And we've been using mostly the same method for the mineral resource. The categories are inferred, indicated, measured. And as mentioned, it goes from inferred, indicated measures as our Increasing level of geological knowledge and confidence uh, rises. So when we have the lesser knowledge and uh, confidence, it has to remain around inferred. When we are more uh, precise and have more data, it can go up to the highest strength, so the measured. Once we talk about mineral reserves, we have two categories, the probable, we have the measured, which correspond to the probable, and then we have the proven. This again is completely related to everything that is taken into consideration of mining, metallurgical, economic, marketing, 
legal and environmental, social and governmental factors. So these are all the modifying factors to be able to pass from mineral resource to mineral reserves. Another concept I thought was very important for today is that people understand that now the modern mines are using what we call the geometallurgy for mining. So that means they are combining both the geological and the mining or metallurgical knowledge and blending all that together into a new science, which is called the geometallurgy, which is the integration of geological, mining, metallurgical, environmental and economic information to maximize the net present value or the NPV of an ore body while minimizing the technical and operational risks. So before the geological department will work alone, the mining department will work alone, the metallurgical department will work alone, the environmental department will work alone, everything that had to do with the economy, the budget will work alone. Now, everything is integrated and everything is integrated so that within our mineral resource uh, cells, as I shown, all of that data is included within each of the cells, which allows a definition of the optimum extractive metallurgy flow sheet designed over life of mine based on the documented geological, geochemical, mineralogical, textural, and metallurgical characteristics of on ore deposit. And it involves a state-of-the-art methodologies that take into account the specific characteristics of an ore deposit. So nothing, again, is left to chance. And all the different kinds of observations are interrelated and working together. And this is a great illustration to show that. And it's from a uh, the study of uh, Simon Michaud from 2020, very, very recent, showing that the same rock with the difference, the different data coming from all these different uh, scientific pluridisciplinary uh, departments, all add within the same rock, the same cell used within the uh, model, add extra information to be or to rank the mineral estimation. So all the all parts of the mining process are working on the same rock, but with different technical languages, so with different departments. This means that the rock itself becomes the data transfer point to examine multiple process behaviors and or type mineral definitions. So all of these different departments that usually did not talk to each other are now in putting all their observations, all their interpretations together, and this helps build more intelligent minds. The conventional mine development, each department have their own flow sheets and would work separately. The actual geometallurgically supported mine developments are now, have now all of their flow working sheets working together and related together. It is not working in a silo um, managing way, but is, it is working in an interconnected, more intelligent way to include all the different uh, expertise teams observations together. Example here, just within the geological uh, spectrum, when we talk about rock texture, and also uh, putting emphasis on what scale, what observation scale are we using? Are from macro to a meso scale? What does it impact uh, within a mining? So if we're working at the biggest macro scale, regional scale, yes, we have a rock mass, and yes, we can see that there is a difference in textures and, and structures. But the more we zoom in within that same rock, the more we can pinpoint some observations that will be key to the mining uh, concept of our, our body. The more we zoom in, the more we have data that will come out here. For example, 
from our structures or our textures, we have we can see that we have several discontinuities with our rock. It is not as seen from far as something that is continuous. If we zoom in, we see that we have some discontinuity. If we keep zooming in, we can see that we have two main different orientations. We have, let's say, if we are looking north this way, we have an east-west orientation and a north-north-south orientation. But we can also see from there that we have a chronology. We can see that since we have a displacement on the north-south orientation, that the east-west is the youngest one. And then when we superpose these textures with the distribution of the ore and the um, grain analysis, we might find out that, oh, well, it's this discontinuity, discontinuity uh, trend that is more important for the ore. And so this is given back to the um, miners and to the uh, engineers. And then they can plan zooming in at the smallest scale exactly which structures and textures to mine out. To be our ore. Other examples for geometallurgy, um, putting examples here is from EOS because they have been working to develop for the past years um, to see that everything talks together from the laboratory to the consultants to the field and to the mining environment. So they have been developing a lot of geometallurgical approach as simple as all of the geo geologists' um, observations, main observations, the rock alteration, textures, and structures within either samples or the or core samples, will add in each information again within each of our model cells to know to pinpoint the areas where uh, there was some highly bricketed area highly altered um, with epidote and hematite, um, schistos area with uh, moderate, moderate schistosity with some sericite. Um, they're also going to be able to pinpoint where the rock was not uh, deformed structurally, but had some highly intense uh, geochem chloritization alteration and here again with both fracturation and epidotization. So all these details are put in within each of the cells of the model for the resource estimation. We have the mineralization types because that is also very important. Do we have uh, disseminated sulfur mineralization? Do we have sulfurs within veins and veinlets? Um, the veins thickness and their own deformation is important too for the miners to be able and for the engineers to be able to define the continuity of the zones. So again, that information within the cells is very important for the mineral estimation uh, model. Uh, do we have sulfurs? And if we do, are they semi-massive, massive sulfurs? Which cells are richer in these sulfurs? So, and which which sulfurs are associated to the gold and so on. Um, within the uh, smaller scale of this observation is if we pass from uh, either a rock sample or a core sample to what we call tin sections. So we are using a microscope to make some operations that we cannot see with the eye example here to know the distribution of and what type of sulfurs we have. So the pyrite, the calcopyrite, um, arsenal pyrite, we see that we have gold within arsenal pyrite. So that's how we know the link between the two. So the arsenal pyrite could be a key mineral to pinpoint when we will have some gold. We can also, with some minerals, detect some deformation or displacement within our mineral 
uh, mineralized zone. So that would pinpoint maybe some structures around and so on. So all this is used and added within each cells of the model, hence the geometallurgical model. Uh, true, this is an example from uh, for complete uh, for the mining life cycle, complete mining life cycle from the exploration prospection uh, step up to the mine closure and each type of uh, geophysical exploration methods that are used, the measures that can be added to each of these steps and add on some uh, high ranking, uh, high confidence information that would help also define the cells of the mineral resource model. So that is a great image too that shows that from the start, from step one to the closure of the mine, each of these methods are really important and play an important role within each of the mine cycle steps. Three great places where they are working and defining new uh, geometallurgical approaches in Quebec are the EOS team, the Consorium team, and the UCAT Polytechnique IRME team. And now a little overview of uh, costs of building a mine. People, people always say, um, well, how come they're closing or how come it takes so long to open? Well, like any other company, everything has a cost. So the mine planning as illustrated here, once we know we have resource and reserves, the mine strategy solution, so the mine strategy, the mine design and scheduling and the actual mine operational steps. Everything is related to what we call a central database. Central database includes what? It includes every department, every department I've shown for the geometallurgy. So everything that comes from the geology, the mining geology, the mine planning from the engineers, the surveys, the drill and the blast from the mine developments, everything that has to do with the production. So the grade control to make sure that everything that we mine is ore and less waste, everything that has to do with the mine safety or the geotechnical uh, studies of, this, of the mine that has to do with uh, the RQD, the, the, the rocks hardness, um, and so softness and the rheology to make sure that physically the site is safe both for the site and around the site. And also always an exploration team that is ongoing um, near and a bit far from the mine to try, always try to find either new deposits or uh, extensions to the actual deposit to again keep the mine uh, alive for as long as possible and the final ore control that is done with the entire team and related to the same central database. I've included a table, I won't go through all of them, uh, all the points, but you will have it here and basically is the main uh, stages of uh, the mine cycle with the stages, the main activities that is done, and their estimation in years, how long it, it takes to go to complete that step, and roughly the cost and the unique cost of each step. Uh, keep in mind that this uh, comes from 216, but it based on work about eight years ago. So the prices might have changed a bit, but at least it gives a range of prices for each uh, steps. So the main steps I've seen so far, um, the prospecting mineral deposit steps, the exploration, the ore body, the actual development of the mine, 
the exploitation, so while the mine is producing, and the last reclamation step, so each with the years and their actual cost. So uh, people will understand also uh, how much money is put within these projects before they can even make uh, $1 of income. Another uh, concept I wanted people to understand that is very important within uh, building a mine is the actual mineral supply and demand. Like any other business, globally, mineral distribution is very uneven. Some countries have plenty. They're known as the export nations. Other countries have none. They're known as the import nations. So import and export relationships fluctuate like any other business. The world demand is constant fluctuating, the commodities do not follow fluctuating trends, and technology often allows more access to difficult or low-grade ore deposits. If we look just historically within the Abitibi mining camp, we can see that the mines between the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s were mainly done close to the surface, subsurface, going down with drill holes, going down to roughly 150, 200 meters, because that was the extent of the uh, technology back then. As per se, that is why many historical mines nowadays reopen with the highest prices of the commodities and the high technological um, tools and newer approach. Uh, it is now sometimes economically um, interesting to reopen some of these uh, historical mines for these reasons. Future, future mineral resource shortages will occur and cause international tension with eventual mineral reserve depletion. So it is unrealistic and unlikely to be able to control future consumption rates to either reduce the mineral rates consumption or to hold the actual mineral rates consumption steady. That is impossible. Globally, the less developed nations are striving to achieve comparable standards of living as the technology advanced uh, uh, within advanced countries enjoy. Countries that have the fattest, fastest growing populations are not well endowed with mineral deposits and are the less Different countries of the world right now. So the factors affecting the viability of exploiting mineral deposits are the extraction co costs affected by, as we've seen, the depth, the overburden quality, the drainage problems, the size of the deposit. The processing costs of extracting a metal depends on the other elements which, with which it is combined. Perfect example is the aluminum. Aluminum is more abundant in clay, but can only be economically extracted from bauxite. The puri purity of the mineral deposit is important. The financial cost, the energy required and quantity of ore bearing rock extracted increase rapidly as ore purity decreases. The competing land uses may be considered more important or viable than mining. Example, urban areas, conservation of landscape or wildlife, there will, be ne there will never be allowed to open a mine. Uh, the transport costs affected also by the distance to the market, the ease of bulk transport, and the presence of a suitable existing transport infrastructure plays a major role. And that too has changed drastically uh, with the past, uh, with mines in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, with less infrastructures and methods to transport the mineral deposit. And last but not least, the market economics. Like any other industry, demand and sell value of the minerals control, the economic viability of exploiting a particle, particular mineral deposit. So, two things here the cutoff grade is the lowest ore purity that can be exploited economically. So this is something when the mines concepts are being done and defined cutoff grades, there are different scenarios that are done. And this is where one that 
we have several tables with several scenarios. Example here, I just, I did a simple sketch. So you can understand the difference between three different scenarios and the difference that will, it will play on the exploitation zone area as seen here on the surface. So, um, the more our cutoff grade is high, the lesser volume of our exploitation zone we will have. The lowest cutoff grade we will have, the largest exploitation zone we will have, and the intermediate one, well, we have an intermediate. So this too is a factor that is taken in consideration in knowing which cutoff grade is the best to have to be uh, or to have or open an economic uh, viable mine. And this is also played out uh, using our knowledge of what we call our high grade ore versus our low grade ore. So these high grade zone and low grade zone, they have a major influence to the uh, exploited economical mine. And this too will play as um, defining which model of mine we will use to build the mine and which zones we will reach out first and leave the maybe the lower grade zones area for later. And when the commodity prices go up, while well, lower grade zones can become important and interesting to go and mine too as well. So the future of mineral supplies, basically reserves of exploitable minerals are finite. That's another very important point to understand today and that they are not non-renewable resources. Like I said before, it does not grow back. Whatever ore is extracted from the ground is extracted and will not grow back. A range of methods may be used to extend the time period in which they may be exploited. So more, more exploration in previously unexplored areas. So either uh, remote areas with difficult conditions like in the Antarctic, uh, within the deep ocean floor. I can also add here within the space, there's a lot of space exploration going on now. Um, better exploratory techniques, so using um, newer uh, techniques and more precise techniques like remote sensing surveys, including everything with satellite and different geophysical methods. Better and more mechanized mining techniques, uh, so larger excavators which can go deeper within the ground at lower costs. And, use the, and the use of low grades are uh, with the uh, procedures like electrolysis of spoil heat leaches to remove the copper, or even use bacterial recovery from disused mine spoil, from mine waste to go get some low grade ores and add some value of the ore deposit. I wanted to finish the lesson before the videos to show how um, there's a lot of everyday things we use uh, that um, are mined and some people tend to forget. Simple example, the first example, our crayon, our pencil, our lead pencils coming from graphite. So simple, simple graphite uh, sample doing our points here for our crayon, but I wanted to push it even forward. A simple crayon, what do we need to create a simple crayon? Past our graphite, which is powder, which is forming our point to write. Well, the entire crayon here is basically formed by the eraser, comes from the petroleum industry. The brass at the end containing the eraser well, is brass is just an alliage or alloy in English, which combine zinc and copper. And then we have um, iron to shape the pencil. We have pigments from different uh, sampling for the painting. 
and we have our clay and the graphite to do the points. So a simple pencil that we use every day needs all these mining uh, ex extracts to be able to exist. If we move on to a bauxite, bauxite is the primary ore of aluminum. Almost all of the aluminum that has been produced is extracted from bauxite. Bauxite is used in what? Well, some examples here from bikes, the bike's handles. I've included also for a bike, every other parts that needs to come from a mine to exist. Um, fluoride, what does fluoride do in our life? It brings the fluoride for our toothpaste. Without the fluoride, no toothpaste. Silver. Silver has many uses. I, I maybe did not show the most important ones, but some that we use every day from the cutlery, from the coins, necklaces, bracelets, and so on, with a super sample here of uh, native silver. The zinc. Zinc, uh, everyday life, more industrial use maybe, like the batteries, uh, batteries on our phone, our regular batteries, metal wires, and also uh, to know that zinc is a natural element and that can be fine in the food we eat every day and that is very important for us, for our health. Copper. Copper, again, very important for everything that has to do with wires, pipes, jewelry, and some industri industrial uses too. Um, the tin, tin comes uh, very handy for our smartphones, cans, all kinds of cans uh, through the uh, history it was done by tin, jewels, etc. Our famous salt, NACL, mines of salt, salt that we eat, that is uh, uh, mandatory for our, our health. It is the only source salt for our health where we can find the iodine. And of course, with uh, for de-icing agents like our roads and our house entrances and so on. Iron, iron many uses again for batteries, um, any other industrial use. And again, iron is a natural element that can be found in many of our food. And tungsten, tungsten, without tungsten, we won't have any light bulbs, uh, jewels, and so on. And this one I like too, because it comes from the USGS, the United States uh, uh, Geological Survey. Well, it shows a simple smartphone, all the elements that needs to be mined for the smartphone to exist and for us to be, uh, to have and to use. Without all these elements, the, the smartphone would not exist. So we're going to move on finally to the um, videos for today. The first three videos, I'll show you the first three videos. So the basic one, the first one is, we'll explain exactly what we mean by economic geology uh, and what it distinguishes ore from regular mineral deposits. And finally, um, this one is nice because it will resume uh, the uh, La Sonde curve with all these steps to go from exploration, prospection to opening a mine. The last two are from the Quebec Ministry of Mining and I'll let them to you if you are curious. This one, just, just a little survey on the mining industry in Quebec, very short. And this uh, is the newest one from last week from the Quebec Ministry where they are um, doing a serious program for the upcoming years for the mineral and critical uh, strategic, strategic plan to uh, mine these critical uh, 
minerals that will be on demand in the future years. So I'm going to move out of my PowerPoint. So the first video, what is the what is economic uh, geology? You probably don't think about it much in your daily life, but the majority of the modern conveniences you enjoy are relying on Earth's natural resources. A perfect example is the computer you are using to watch this video. Inside your computer, you'd find a microprocessor made of silicon, drives made of various metals and metal alloys, all of which are likely encased in plastic, which is made from oil, or maybe your computer has an aluminum case, which is also from the Earth. Before they powered your computer, the components of these parts once started as raw materials within the Earth. The Earth's population is currently over 7 billion people and growing. More people means that we need more natural resources. As the population grows, we are facing many important questions. How long will our oil reserves last? Are there new ore bodies that we haven't discovered yet? Can we find new mineral resources deeper in the Earth? To help us answer these questions, we turn to the field of economic geology. Economic geology is the study of the formation and extraction of earth materials that have some economic potential in society. Economic potential means that they are materials that are currently valuable or may potentially be valuable in the future. These economically valuable materials are generally called mineral resources and include minerals and ore deposits. Ore deposits are just useful rocks that are mined for a profit, such as gold and copper. Oil and gas are also commonly referred to as mineral resources, despite the fact that they are not actually minerals. What makes mineral resources unique and valuable is that they are only rarely renewable in our lifespans. Renewable resources are earth resources that are naturally replenished on short timescales, like solar energy. Non-renewable resources are those that exist in finite amounts. These also include resources that we use at exponentially higher rates than are being naturally replenished. You've likely heard crude oil referred to as a non-renewable resource. Oil is formed from decomposing organic material that is compressed and eventually broken down into carbon and hydrogen molecules. While this process can still occur today, scientists think that it takes hundreds of thousands of years to make a swamp into a barrel of crude oil. Thus, we consider oil to be non-renewable because the supply will not be naturally replenished in our lifetimes. The value of mineral resources is dependent on several factors. First, there must be a market demand for a particular resource. It's not valuable unless we have some use for it. Once a resource is determined to be useful, the particular qualities of the resource determine its value, including whether it's renewable, its rarity, and the ease at which geologists can locate and extract it. Mineral resources have formed very slowly by major Earth's processes throughout the history of Earth. Some of these processes are extremely common, and thus the resulting mineral resources are found globally. For instance, limestone is a common building material. Limestone is a rock formed in shallow, warm seas by the deposition of tiny carbonate shells. Not only is it a common rock in the geologic record, there are numerous warm, shallow seas globally where limestone is slowly being formed today. On the other hand, resources like diamonds are extremely rare. They are formed in deposits called kimberlites, which are vertical intrusions of magma from deep within the Earth's crust. Only about 50 mines globally produce the majority of the world's diamonds. Once geologists locate valuable mineral resources, the process is not over. Economic geologists must then evaluate whether the concentration of the resource in the deposit is worth the cost of extracting it. Thus, geologists estimate the grade, which is the relative quantity of ore in an ore body. For instance, the best gold mines in the world have a grade of around 10 grams per ton. This means that for every ton of rock mined from the ground contains only 10 grams of gold. That's less than half an ounce of gold in a ton of rock. Gold is so valuable that it is still profitable to mine despite these seemingly low returns. 
Given the scarcity of mineral resources, accurately locating them and assessing their worth is extremely important. To find these important resources, we must understand more about the processes that form them. The lessons in this chapter will delve into how economically valuable minerals become concentrated, what makes them unique compared to other minerals, and where we can expect to find them on Earth. So in summary, economic geology is the study of the formation. The next video will be to pinpoint, again, the importance, the difference between ore and a simple mineral that is not considered to be an ore. You may be able to go outside and easily find a rock in the ground, but chances are this rock is not worth any money. Mining and exploration companies spend millions of dollars looking for valuable mineral deposits in the Earth's surface. What makes these deposits different than the common rocks you might find in your backyard? These valuable deposits are called ore deposits and are the subject of this lesson. Ore deposits are solid, naturally occurring mineral deposits that can be extracted from the earth for an economic profit. What makes ore deposits unique is the economic benefit that can be gained by extracting these minerals. There are several factors that influence the value of individual ore deposits. While we must extract all of our metallic resources from the earth's crust, the crust is actually quite poor in metals compared to deeper parts of the earth. For instance, when we look at the crust as a whole, silver only makes up 8 parts per billion of the Earth's crust. For this reason, it is not economical to mine any random part of the Earth and try to extract silver. Production mines exist in locations where an ore deposit is concentrated in much greater levels than typical crustal abundances. This concentration level is also known as a concentration factor, which is the ore concentration needed to be an economically viable deposit divided by the average crustal abundance. For instance, iron makes up approximately 6% of the Earth's crust, but must be present at about 40% to be an economically viable ore deposit. This equals a concentration factor of about 6 to 7 for iron to be a valuable ore deposit. Part of the cost of extracting these valuable deposits is that they are surrounded by hard silicate minerals that are not valuable and termed gang minerals. The process of removing gang from the valuable ore can be quite difficult and time consuming depending on the size of the ore minerals. These unwanted minerals form vast tailing deposits at mines, which are sometimes later the target of further mineral extraction. As you would assume from the name, economic geology is heavily influenced by economic forces such as supply and demand. Supply is how much of a good or product that the market can offer. Demand is how much a good is desired by customers. A good example of this is the recent rise in popularity of the lithium-ion battery. These batteries are used in most modern technology, ranging from computers to cell phones to hybrid cars. In fact, the demand for lithium compounds has grown 22% per year from 2000 to 2008. Thus, the demand of lithium has been greatly increasing. In economic geology, the supply is driven by the natural abundance and location of the ore deposits. Unlike most market products, we cannot increase the supply simply by making more lithium. We are limited to the amount of ore deposit that currently exists on Earth. Increased demand provides the drive for more exploration to find new and more cost-effective means of extracting a deposit from the Earth. Thus far, the lithium production has been able to grow to meet the rising demand. It is important to note that the price of ore deposits are not a static feature. You may have heard numerous news reports about the varying price of gold. The price fluctuates daily due to the demand for gold, current costs of extracting new ore, the amount of recycled gold on the market, and the prospect for the amount of gold available in the future. Because the demand and market price of ore deposits are fluctuating on short and long terms, the concentration of ore that can be economically mined are also variable. This is especially true as the demand for a certain ore rises and the supply is dwindling. In these cases, it becomes more economical to mine lower concentrations of ore than in more favorable market conditions. 
The variation in market prices for ore will often cause companies to close mines during periods of low prices and reopen in periods of high demand. This is especially true in countries such as the U.S., which have high cost of labor. And the final video is the one that will resume um, all the Lasson curve steps from the prior lessons we've seen also and to the uh, mining cycle. When you think of mining, you probably think of giant pits in the earth where workers remove valuable metals or gemstones. However, that is the end of a long, difficult, and very expensive process. Before companies can begin to pull valuable metals like copper out of the earth, geologists must first locate these deposits, determine whether they are cost-effective to extract, and commit a large amount of capital to opening a new mining operation. The process of locating new minerals is called mineral exploration, which can be divided into three large stages, target identification and investigation, resource evaluation, and development and production. Very few projects make it through all of these stages and get to production. Instead, most are abandoned due to insufficient resources at a particular location. In this lesson, we'll delve further into these stages to learn how geologists locate valuable mineral deposits. In the past, mineral deposits were found by geologists mapping the surface of the earth looking for clues of valuable mineralization. However, because we have been searching for these deposits for hundreds of years, traditional prospecting methods are rarely used, except in some remote locations such as Alaska and Russia. Now most mineral exploration is performed by specialized teams of geologists using modern geophysical techniques, including magnetic and gravity surveys, which we will look at in greater detail later in this lesson. Before companies can begin paying for costly surveys, geologists decide on a large area that is likely to have the mineral deposit of interest. This area is normally several thousands of miles across and can stretch across multiple countries. Geologies examine regular maps, geologic maps, and any other geologic data at this stage to attempt to narrow down the area. In the case of valuable metals, geologists are often looking for specific clues, such as minerals and high concentrations of certain elements. For instance, copper often forms from hydrothermal fluids near volcanic activity. Hydrothermal fluid is hot groundwater that circulates through the bedrock, enriching it in valuable metals. This circulation of hot fluids severely alters the nearby rocks. Thus, geologists will often look for this type of alteration as a clue that there may be copper nearby. Once geologists are certain that there is a good potential for valuable economic deposits to be in a certain area, they will begin a more targeted reconnaissance missions. This stage can involve some quick sample collecting and analysis, geologic mapping, airborne surveys, and geophysical surveys. The geophysical surveys tools developed in modern times are a powerful way to quickly determine whether an area is a likely source of valuable deposits. These methods look for variations in gravity, magnetism, and seismic behavior. Since the majority of magnetic mineral deposits are more dense than the average bedrock, all of these methods are basically looking for physical anomalies that may suggest that a dense, metal-rich deposit is present at depth. Other survey tools, such as magnetic surveys, allow geologists to map the underlying structures of the Earth. If an exploration team is tracking a particular geologic unit, they may want a magnetic survey to understand the underlying structures in the area. Once our geologist teams have targeted a specific area for having all of the required clues of valuable mineral deposits, they then begin a greater detailed investigation into the economic potential of the area. As we learned in a different lesson in this course, we only care about mineral deposits because they have economic potential in our society, meaning they are useful enough to become valuable. One way we classify the economic potential of a mineral deposit is by determining its grade. Grade is the concentration of the metal in a body of rock and is normally expressed as a percent. It can be understood as the amount of metal per unit rock. For instance, 
If a deposit has 50 pounds of copper for 1,000 pounds of rock, the grade would be 0.05 or 5%. But how do geologists estimate this grade before they start mining? We know they have already chosen an area that is a likely target and have performed geophysical surveys. The next step is to actually begin to drill holes into the earth to test whether their hypotheses are correct. These samples are rigorously logged and examined by geologists for the present of valuable mineralization or further clues. Cores will be drilled at multiple locations surrounding and within the target area to allow geologists to best pinpoint the exact location of the deposit. Imagine that you are trying to locate the extent of filling in a jelly donut using only a straw. Each time you pull out the straw, you'd either have just donut or layer donut and jelly. By poking the donut multiple times, you could eventually figure out where the edges of the jelly are within the donut. In much the same way, geologists have to drill these cores to probe inside the earth and learn where the boundaries of the deposit are. Using these samples, and hopefully some recovered ore samples, geologists can then begin to estimate the extent of the deposit and the grade of the ore. Only large deposits with a higher percentage of ore have the best chance of resulting in actual mining development and production. Because some metals are so valuable, grades below 1% can still be worthwhile mining investments. When a resource is confidently located and the ore grade has been assessed, companies then begin to plan their mining operations. Since most mines are located in remote areas, Beginning a new operation is a huge endeavor that requires building infrastructure, bringing in earth-moving equipment, and building roads and power sources. While the resource exploration is performed by trained geologists, the actual mine development and operations are overseen by mining engineers, who are trained to design safe and effective ways to best extract a deposit. You've likely seen the intricate pit mines that are dug deeper and deeper into the earth. These must be carefully planned and designed so that workers can safely extract as much valuable ore as possible. Production occurs when the minerals are being extracted from the earth and refined into the valuable raw materials that we require. As you can tell, it's a long process to get to the point of actually mining the materials from the earth. Despite all of the mines that have been active throughout time, there are innumerable failed exploration projects that did not result in final resource production. So this completes the uh, final lesson of block three. So I hope uh, you learned uh, the more important steps of um, building a mine. And back. All right, so I guess that concludes our ninth installment. Uh, we'll call them the basics of building a mine. Yes. Once again, real interesting, plenty of matter to unpack. Uh, I personally learned a lot, especially with any, anything that had to do with ores and the market surrounding yeah. that. I found that especially interesting. Um, so that will, that will conclude block three. That means we will move on to block four next week. And it will be our 10th of 12 installment on uh, geology in the mining sector. Uh, once again, if you catch this uh, on, in, on a replay, uh, and if you have any questions, uh, feel free to send them at info at iddpnql.ca. Once again, we'll pass that information along to Francine and we'll get right back to you as soon as possible. Until then, stay safe and we'll come back to you uh, next week with some more geology and mining sector content. Have a great day. Thank you.